sorry for the reschedule, but I'm glad everybody uh, who could be could be here today. Our guest is Dr. Johanna Katrin Friedrichsdotir at the National Library of Norway, and she has recently had published by Bloomsbury, right? Yeah. Uh, a new book, Valkyrie, Women in the Viking Age, and it is... Viking world. <laughs> Viking world, okay. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I got the... Uh, I got the subtitle. Wrong. Yeah, but it's it's confusing because Judith Yash's um, classic book is oh you got it. I oh, I'm it. so glad. <laughs> I got my advanced proof right here. Um, Excellent. It is admirably well organized. I actually really like how you put it together with um, the first chapters, actually focusing on different stages of life. Right. Thank I think you. that's a really great way of doing it. So you've got infancy and childhood, teenage, adulthood and then getting into uh, matters of, of parentage, things like that, widows, old age and death. I mean, actually doing it as a chronological look at the life of a woman mm -hmm. is I think a really a really good way of organizing that. Um, and it wasn't I, I what should, I was expecting. Okay, I should say that um, it was actually Caroline Larrington who uh, said to me, because I had been kind of thinking about writing this and I said it to her and then she said, oh, you should structure it along the life cycle. And I just went, okay. Oh, well, that's, <laughs> um, that's cool. She's, she's really cool. Yeah, she is, yes. <laughs> one, of the, one of the nicest people in the business. Absolutely. So do you want to tell us a little bit about the book, about your work right now, and then we can take some questions from the audience? Yeah, so as you said, um, it, it does follow the life cycle. So I didn't want to kind of organize it by um, by like oh, written sources, archaeological sources, or something like that. I just thought it would be cool to try to um, integrate them um, and tell the story of, of different women's lives. I mean, I try to incorporate um, different, you know, sort of intersectional perspectives, I guess. Um, and just uh, sort of make clear the just the incredibly um, sort of rich um, and varied life that that different women had probably. Um, so, like if you were a really high status woman, you probably had a very different life from maybe a low status woman. And um, if you were, you know, a settler, you had a different life from somebody who maybe lived on a farm in Sweden. Um, and so on. So I, I'm just trying to kind of explain the just how varied life could be um, in this time. And and then I, I, I start with like just kind of going over some of the mythology. And um, I guess I found that, that the mythology really sort of tells you something about some of the fundamental values, I guess. Um, and then I I also sort of talk about the, the sources at the beginning and how we can use them. Um, and then I, I, yeah, I couldn't resist sort of adding a little pop culture here and there. Um, there's a couple of references to like Game of Thrones and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I feel like um, I tried to like cover as much as I could with, um, and like not, um, just leave um, out really important stuff, but obviously you can't cover everything. Oh, well, sure. Either. It's always That's a selection, funny. always kind of a, yeah. an essentialization. Yeah, but but um, I don't know if people know this, but but <laughs> I'm I'm like a literary scholar and a philologist, and I sort of my day job now is to work with manuscripts, medieval manuscripts, and I'm doing an edition of uh, medieval um, law code. Which one? Um, it's the the town laws of Norway that were passed in 1276. And they are absolutely fascinating. And I am learning so much new stuff. And like, I, I didn't know that medieval people had like fire regulations and zoning laws. And <laughs> um, <laughs> like, I'm not surprised. It's really, yeah, like, it's just really sophisticated. And I, I will just be the first to admit that I, I didn't realize just how kind of yeah, like there's just a lot of like health and safety and <laughs> um, yeah, and like some inter interesting gender stuff there as well. But but um, but yeah, I'm I'm making an edition of of the laws, so I'm I'm working with medieval manuscripts all day basically. Are those what I read about in Norwegian sources uh, as called uh, borgaret? 
It's called B love and like B love. Okay. Or oh, like by law. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, exactly. So I guess um, I mean it's it's usually called like by it by or something like that in Old Norse. Um, but then they also call it Bjarkerjetter sometimes in some manuscripts, um, which is like a weird historical quirk. But hmm. but yeah, Bilov, I guess, is how they usually refer to it. Very cool. Anyway, we're not here to uh, talk about that too much. Oh, no, that's interesting stuff. Uh, yeah. Actually, we have a question down here. S. Faust asks, what kind of interesting gender stuff is there in the law? Oh, <laughs> um, well, for example, I thought it was... Um, really interesting that that um, women are allowed to own property, but they uh, they need to ask um, permission if they want to sell their house, um, whereas the men don't need to ask anybody permission. Um, and I mean, there's like, I actually tweeted about this the other day that there was this um, clause about if you come across a really drunk person and they are like too drunk to kind of know where they, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, where they live or anything. And then it says like, whether it's a man or a woman, this is what you should do. And I just thought, wow. So, I mean, they kind of, they just like afford everyone the same kind of human dignity and. Um, yeah, it's kind of compassionate. Yeah, I thought it was really compassionate. And I, I just thought like, well, if you, if you come across a drunk person, you are like responsible for taking care of them and you have to try to get them home. Um, and like, you know, it, it just tells you that like people, people's life has value. And, um, and I just thought about it so much because I was like collating it. Um, and then I was looking at these news and, you know, people just kind of being like, well, it's only old people who die anyway from COVID. And oh, sure. <laughs> and it's like, well, you know, everybody's life has value and you, it's not up to other people to decide. Like, <laughs> but well, yeah. At the same time, imagine if that rule about helping drunk people home was valid in a college town like Boulder or New Haven. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Quickly stress the infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Jessica Rose Santana asks, uh, was there a salient point or detail about women and the culture that you were hoping to drive home for interested lay people in your book, for instance? Well, um, probably a lot of, a lot of different points. Um, I, I mean, I think my main goal was kind of, I wanted to be true to history and, you know, I didn't want to, like oversimplify things and just sort of reduce things to like, oh, Viking women were really strong, or like Viking women had rights, legal rights or whatever. I I wanted to try to represent the nuances. Um, and and I, I sort of, I wanted to get across just how, how interesting the sources are and how, like, yes, it is true that Viking women like must have had um, a lot of rights, for example, le re legal rights that maybe the rest of European women didn't have and so on. But like, then it, it's a question of whether they were actually able to enforce these rights. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I sort of wanted to try to get across just how complex and nuanced um, the sources are and how varied um, people's sure. lived, lived experiences would have been. Well, and one thing that I notice a lot in, you know, you mentioned pop culture, is you tend to have one extreme or the other reflected in pop culture depictions. So you exactly. have it depicted as this like feminist paradise where every woman is Wonder mm. Woman. Exactly. Or you have the like, you know, hyper masculine society where you barely see women, uh, yeah. maybe serving drinks at a table or something like that. And the the reality is obviously much more complex. And somewhere, you know, in the in, the, in all the limitless possibilities between those, um, and varies probably from region to region, century to century. There's probably some trends that peak. Absolutely. And, and, you know. Could you yeah. talk a little bit about that about variation during the Viking Age? Uh, geographically over time, do you see trends? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's sort of difficult 
to nuance it very far, probably like on the sure. graph or something. But um, I mean, in different regions, the the, the archaeologists certain, certainly kind of come up, up with certain um, variation in like the way women dressed, for example, that might tell us something about um, access to trade and mm -hmm. just their economic status and so on. Sure. Um, I mean, it's. I think it's kind of impossible to use the written sources to kind of trace very much variation within the Viking Age. I mean, I think they help us more, like with with the kind of overall structures, like the social structures and the values and, and the kind of myths people told each other and so on. Um, but yeah, like the. I think it's really interesting the, like the kind of brooches and stuff, for example, that shows up in Norwegian graves. And they were always interpreted as like these gifts that the Viking men would be, bring back to their wives. Um, and you can kind of trace a lot of, I, I think those can kind of be dated too often, like within 50 years or something like mm. that. Um, but then I think the, the kind of more recent studies have been saying, well, why didn't like, isn't it possible that these women might have actually traveled themselves and bought them or <laughs> sure. um, acquired them somehow um, or like bought them at a market or something like that? So it's it's like it's like the, the sort of just wanting to bring more possibilities um, of, of interpretation, I think, is, is sort of the general trend, maybe. That, well, and that's very um, valuable. Yeah. Uh, Case and S what the runes on the book cover say. Um, I think you have a contest right now about that. Yeah. So you may not want to reveal it. Yeah. Do, do you want to give any, anyone a hint? Well, I would just say Google um, the younger food mark, the runic alphabet, and then you ought to be able to <laughs> decipher them. I always, um, I always approve of younger food arc. <laughs> There's too much elder yeah. out there. Yeah. As Faust asks, is there anything in the law about self-defense? Is it different for men versus women? Oh, I can't really remember off the top of my head, to be honest, about self-defense. I mean, there, there's definitely like in the laws, it's it's as much of a crime to kill a, a, man, a woman as a man. Um, but do you remember anything in, about self-defense? I mean, I'm thinking about what you, what kind of what you're, you're thinking about it being seemingly the same kind of crime in the sagas. I do think about something like yeah. in Gisli saga where Outher slaps, um, I can't remember yes. his name, but Outher slaps um, the guy, yeah. yeah, tries to, to uh, bribe her. And yeah. he wants to hit her back or something, but all the other men said, no, that's shameful. Too, yeah, too shameful. Yeah. yeah, that's true. I mean, um, I mean, generally, like if, like all of the laws kind of say, like if a, a woman has been, you know, if there's been a crime committed against a woman, like it's usually the man, like her her relative who's allowed to take any any sort of vengeance. Um, mm -hmm. So the laws sort of normally doesn't. Um, yeah, like it doesn't allow for the possibility that the, the woman takes vengeance herself unless she's a single, um, like it, the, the only child and there's no brothers. Right. Um, yeah, Grogos is kind of like that where you have seduction cases and things like that. It's 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 really a case of the men of her family against the, absolutely. the men of, and, of the offending family. Yeah, and the sagas are the same. I mean, the, the, they back that, that up. Um, and like the like in Kormok saga, when there's this sort of man, um, Kormokur, he has this sort of love affair with 
Stinkgerd or isn't her name? Yeah. Mm. And then um and he jilts her at the altar. And I, I mentioned this in the book a little bit. And um and then the father is like really worried that there's gonna be a scandal, so he kind of marries her off immediately yeah. um, to this man who kind of is more likely to be able to defend her honor or something like that. That is, by the way, a really underappreciated saga. Yeah, I've, I've come to enjoy it a lot more. I, I think I used to kind of just not get this Kormakur. <laughs> well, I love the bear wrestling. I mean, that's like he wrestles two bears. <laughs> <laughs> that's worth something. Not one, two. two. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that right there makes it, makes it woefully underappreciated. Yeah. Uh, Nero Stracinger is asking, how did women's rights extend to infant exposure? Uh, could she dispute it with her family or community? Oh, I mean, there's not a, I mean, the, the problem with the written laws in this case is that they, um, they, I mean, they, they, they're all written from, uh, written down that long after Christianity was adopted and like the, the, some of the the other the prose sources kind of talk about talk about how people used to expose infants, um, and then it was kind of banned with Christianity, but but not really, and um, and like sort of from the written sources, it seems like the authorities were trying to stamp it out, infant exposure, and then it um, it just kind of stayed and. It, it was um it's really represented differently in the sagas from what it was probably like in in real life yeah um, i mean speaking but, of Cormac saga it really seems yeah. mostly in the sagas to be about creating drama right absolutely it's, yeah because it sets you up for those i am your father moments right? uh, exactly and i mean saga is a great example of that yeah and and good luck saga as well like right. where the father has the dream about the swan and the, the yeah. raven and all that and, so and like the um yeah and like you know the the authors don't really introduce the concept of infant exposure in order to kind of talk about like well isn't it sad that all these men are like impregnating their servants and then mm. um not helping them <laughs> and um and then but then um in Gunlusa the the mother doesn't want the baby to be exposed when the father orders that and then um and then he like he doesn't listen to her but she kind of like manages to get the child away to like a cousin um and then yeah like six years later the, the father is like a, admiring this beautiful child and <laughs> turns out to be his child but but yeah it seems pretty clear there that like the father does have the right to say i want i want this child exposed unfortunately but um, yeah. Well, and that of course ties in with the kind of the family being the unit, right? Mm -hmm. And the father being the head of that, or would you dispute that picture? Um, no, I would say that's pretty true. I mean, that's not to say that, that wives like didn't have any rights whatsoever, but, right. um, but yeah, he's ultimately, that actually ties into something uh, Cameron Patterson asks here. Uh, how much autonomy did Norse women have in relation to marriage? Pretty big question, but. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, like marriage gives you a fair amount of rights and autonomy um, as opposed to being unmarried. Uh, at least like if you're, if you're a teenage girl, you pretty much don't have any rights at all, right. um, except inheritance rights, actually. Um, but like you don't have the right to uh, reject, like if, if your parents are gonna make you marry somebody, you don't have have the right to say no to that, for example. Um, so like when you get married, you actually um, get a dowry, and then you you actually own some property of your own, and that'll like usually that goes into like a common fund of the household. And then the husband obviously brings in money as well. But um, you're allowed as a wife to spend like a certain amount of money without asking your husband. Um, and I kind of said in the book, like, well, you know, it, it seems that major pur purchases are supposed to be um, 
like you're supposed to consult the husband and I don't really think that's unreasonable <laughs> um like in any relationship but um <laughs> no. you're gonna spend a few thousand dollars on something it makes sense to talk to your spouse it does yeah um but but um but there's like sort of day-to-day -day expenses that you you don't have to like ask right. for permission to spend and so on and then I mean you you're sort of in the line to inheritance you know um and your your children have way more rights than if you're like a concubine, mm. for example, in terms of status and inheritance. Um, this yeah. this always makes me think. This kind of question always makes me think about Lockstill Saga because you have such dramatic examples of divorce, but also of of this sort of forcible marriage. And I think mm -hmm. it can make modern readers. I mean, I've seen it in my sagas classes. Make modern readers say, "Well, you know, if." Guthrie was going to divorce this guy. Like she seems like she wants to from the beginning. Why does she marry him? Right. Like, mm -hmm. why can't she just instantly divorce? But it seems like there's almost a, or, or just reject the marriage in the first place. But it seems like yeah. there's almost a, an incubation period <laughs> between marriage and yeah. divorce uh, before a woman can make that call. Or maybe that's just for drama. What do you, do you have a thought on that? I mean, my thoughts are that just because you know there's a legal provision for something doesn't mean that it's going to be feasible realistically sure. and so for Gudrun I mean I think this this is like her first marriage you're talking about yeah yeah to, so the, what's his name Thorvald is that Thorvald I can't yeah, remember all our like husbands <laughs> yeah <laughs> she's, she's, I yeah that's a lot <laughs> yeah four <laughs> yeah um no, I mean, she's really young. I think she's 15. And even though she's, you know, supposed to be this amazingly impressive young woman and everything, she um, doesn't have the legal right to reject the husband if the father wants her to go into that marriage. Um, and yeah, I mean, she's also young. Like she, you know, you probably just do what your parents tell you to do. Um, or where else are you, you going to go? A, I mean, yeah, like you don't have a lot of leverage. But, but um, I mean, by the time that she gets divorced, she's kind of found a way out with, you know, she has this relationship with the, the second one, the, the one who... Is Thorther? Yeah, Thorther. And he's married to Broca Eider. Oh, right, um, right, right. Who, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the pants lady, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Which is its yeah. own big, big... A dramatic moment in the saga with 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 her coming and and violently avenging that divorce on him yeah yeah and and the saga is kind of like yeah you know she kind yeah. of and like, his, his father-in-law doesn't his father-in-law say i'll go after her and he says no 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 that was yeah this exactly was, this was proportionate for yeah. for anyone who doesn't know the saga he divorces her because uh of a rumor that she wears pants and she comes at night to, I think, the house where they're staying during the uh, the uh, the sheep roundup. Mm -hmm. And she cuts him across the chest with a sword when he's in bed. And then she rides off. And the father-in-law says, well, I'll go after her. And the ex-husband says, no, that was proportionate. I, like, I, I deserved that, basically. Deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's um, probably not super realistic. But do you think that that reflects like a real... Uh, sentiment uh do you do you think there's some of that like divorce is liberation uh thing actually going on in, in real people's lives i don't know i mean it's I, t I took the when i when i talked about divorce in the book i took this example of the sister of snodri Gode in epica saga um who's called thirdid and like she's kind of she reminds me of Gudrun in Lux de la Sala in many ways because um, she's just really complex and like she has her her more positive qualities, but then, you know, she can be petty and like she's supposed to be um, sort of a spendthrift like Gudrun. Um, and then, <clears throat> so she's married to somebody who dies and then um, her brother is this kind of, you know, he's a mover and a shaker. He's he's getting more and more power in that region. And um and he wants her to marry this man who's quite rich, but um he's a bit like nouveau riche, you know, he doesn't have that 
good um, ancestry compared to them and so on. And so, um, so she gets married to him, but then she always has this like old flame called Bjorn. Hmm. And so this marriage is really quite unhappy and she kind of openly cheats on her husband with Bjorn. And you might say like, well, why doesn't she just divorce her husband and marry Bjorn? Um, but when you think about it, Bjorn doesn't seem to be setting things up. Um, sure. So he's not actually he, giving her an escape route. No. So he's like off on some kind of Viking expeditions and whatever. And um, like, I think he kind of leaves after they have a bit of a, a fling and so on and like goes somewhere abroad. And so it's like, and even if she, you know, there's just no concept of like divorcing your husband and just living like, you know, being single. I mean, where right. are you going to go? Right. Um, how are you going to live? Like, what are your resources? If you don't have your brother's support, you know, and he doesn't want her to divorce, presumably. Um, so she just stays in this marriage until the second husband dies. But like that takes years and years. Um, and so, I mean, even if, you know, she may, might have the right to divorce this guy, like she just doesn't have the option of like, she doesn't have an alternative really. Well, that makes perfect sense. I mean, when you think about people's actual options versus what are hypothetical legal possibilities, because I think people often, when they're thinking about the Viking age, they're looking at it one, maybe a little bit too much of the lens of sagas, which are set up to be dramatic fiction. Yeah. And, and they also don't think about the fact that what's a legal possibility is not necessarily a possibility in your life. Right. I'm legally, well, maybe not under coronavirus shutdown, but I'm I'm legally allowed to go to Hawaii right now if I want to. But do I really have, you know, the capability to get there? And once I get there, do I have anywhere to stay or anything to pay for food with? Right. It's it's that line between what's legally allowed and what you can mm -hmm. actually like, feasibly do. Right. When yeah. you actually have the resources to to pull off. And and we know that there are so many laws in society today that go unenforced and sure. you know. Lots of people drive drive drunk and uh, never get um, you know picked up or anything. And um, but but yeah, and then there are all, all kinds of things that we we could do if we wanted to, but we yeah. don't have the means or the opportunity or anything. So I mean, I think that's one of my main goals with this book is like I had so often seen kind of oh. Viking women, they were so powerful and, and strong and they had all these legal rights like divorce. Uh, but then when you sort of start, when you understand the society and how it works a little bit better, then you, you can see that it's not as straightforward and simple. Of course. Uh, Vicky asks, what kinds of sources did you use for your research? Did you include literary narratives or archeological evidence, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we have sort of covered how maybe I approach the sagas. Um, I mean, I I use quite a lot of sagas, but I kind of try to, you know, make it clear like how they are useful as sources. I don't sort of take them at face value. I mean, I think like when you have a woman warrior in a saga and, and there's also a talking dragon, I mean, you you kind of have to, um take that with a bit of grain of salt um sure. and then i i went i read a lot of archaeology i mean i am not an archaeologist and i would never pre pretend to be one but um i read a, a huge amount of stuff that they write so i kind of feel like i at least understand um what the main kind of um issues are and i was using a lot of kind of examples from yeah, like everything from sort of more maybe accessible works down to like report reports from fields and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I I used the rune stones um, and the picture stones that are in Scandinavia. Um, Many of which do then, mention women or or say they yeah. were erected at the behest of a woman. Is something yeah. people often don't don't know. I find. Yeah, exactly. I mean. Um, the, the, the rune stone with the second longest ex, uh, inscription um, in Scandinavia, like the one, apart from the Rök stone, which, which obviously has the longest one, but the second longest um, 
tells this like long story about this family and who died and in what order and then in what order people got married and it it then kind of all ends up being like this one woman who had basically lost her <laughs> like entire family um but she had this runestone raised and then it, it um there's like a whole bunch of other runestones all in the, the like the same vicinity and they're all mentioning each other so they were all like related um and they were like um which stones sorry. are these which which region are uh this is in sweden this is um like this one is called the hillesjö stone i think um, hillesjö and yeah yeah it's in the book so <laughs> i can try to find it oh um, i'll, I'll yeah, pass like, it out yeah well all right uh, yeah here well, yeah, I can dig it up here. I'm sure I'm not <laughs> saying it in a. Oh, okay, I'm sure I'm not saying it in a Swedish way. Pillersjö Uppland, Sweden. It says. Ah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I think if I were Swedish, I would say like Hillersjö, right? But. Yeah, I think because well. my husband is from um, Dalarna in Sweden, they actually pronounce it oh. slightly differently. So that's. That's a cool I... <laughs> Swedish. That's yeah. a cool Swedish, I mean, up and down. Um, so Ulla Mullevaren asks, I was wondering about material remains and how they shape our view on past periods of history. Maybe our perception of Iron Age as male dominated would be somewhat challenged if the material remains tied to typically female aspects of society and life were more enduring. What I mean is we find a lot of iron, but much less textiles, for example. Uh, I know you're a philologist, but maybe you have an opinion on this. Um, so. Yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of opinions on textiles, actually. <laughs> um, like what? Like yeah, and, and, yeah, and, 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 their and their preservation relative to maybe more male-oriented aspects of culture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so clothes and any kind of textile doesn't um, last very long in the ground. Usually, I mean, there's there's um, exceptions like the Oseberg tapestry. I mean, it's not you know in great shape but there are pieces of it that can be kind of um recon or you know we know what what it looked like for the most part i think um and that's because the the clay is so good at preserving or like yeah the textiles were well preserved in that grave um but for the most part um the only piece of textiles that that lasts in graves um is usually like if people had a brooch, for example, like these women often had these oval brooches and then the iron has some kind of chemical reaction with the textile. And so it corrugates, I think is how they, how they I, I can't remember how it's pronounced, but um, so basically the, these tiny little pieces of textile get preserved just on the back of, of these um, metal objects. Hmm. And, um, and so sometimes they, the archaeologists they can see like how um how they were woven so like how fine the clothing was for example like mm -hmm. how fine the threads were how many like threads per centimeter um and sometimes they can also see what color it was um, and if there were patterns and so on um yeah so i i mean there's there's graves where people were like clearly um, buried in like extremely fine clothes. And um, I think also like in the Osberg ship, they, and a few other graves, like they had um, like often like on the, maybe the edges of, of the, the, the sleeve or like around the neck or something, they had silk <laughs> that was imported from somewhere like in the Middle East or, or China or something. So um, they were kind of decorating themselves with, with all this like, textile bling, basically <laughs> right. um but then what i didn't realize before i started um writing this book was like the sales of the viking ships do we ever think about them <laughs> well i don't know i mean i no. I, 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 have a, I guess i have a vision in my head of what one looks like i suspect it's wool it's probably probably yeah. sewn by the women or I mean, have you ever thought about like how long it would take to make a sale? I mean, I had never thought about this. I, no, I, I guess I haven't. I, I think it would be pretty long. 
Yeah, I mean, I if you had like a... I've, I've never sewn a thing in my life except, you know, in an emergency. So yeah, I'm just not equipped to guess. So you have a, a sheep and you have to get the wool off the sheep, share it. Um, mm -hmm. Then you have to pick out all of like the little vegetable uh, or the, you know, the, the bits of straw and whatever. Right. And you comb it. And then you have this kind of cloud of, of fiber and then you start, start spinning it. And it sort of varies how long it takes to spin. And if you're like, you know, an adult woman and you've, you have 20 years of experience and you're really good at spinning it, you're going to be quicker um, at doing that than like a novice, for example. Um, but it takes a really long time to spin, you know, um, enough yarn for like a shirt. Sure. And then you have to set up the loom. So the loom is like standing up against the wall. And I mean, it's like a fairly complicated structure. Um, and you have to set up the warp. So that's the, the yarn that like hangs down mm. um, vertically. And you make those, you put stones, like you, you weigh them down with stones. And then you, <laughs> so right. like then you start weaving. I mean, like I'm simplifying, but this is still like really complicated. So then you start weaving and it just takes forever to wear, uh, weave like, you know, a piece of cloth. Um, and then you, like if you're making a shirt, you know, this would take you like weeks probably um, from start to finish. And so like just to clothe one family, that's like, you know, if you're just a nuclear family, so-called, um, like the woman would probably spend like the better part of the day doing all of this. Yeah, that's um, a job. I mean, that's a nearly a full-time job. Yeah, and like if you imagine just the strain it puts on your hands and like your entire sure. body. Sure. Um, so if you, are like someone who wants to um, get a Viking expedition going, you have to get the ship made, right? You also have to have a sail made. And like for one person, um, these uh, archaeologists, they've calculated that it would take one person like four to five years of full time work to do this. So if you have 10 people, that would take them like an entire winter to make right. a sail. But hmm. this um, for some reason, this doesn't really get talked about very much, um, but like it just takes so much effort, just like the resources, the skill, like just the, yeah, everything. Um, so when we think about like what enabled the, the Vikings to be Vikings, um, like the ships are a big part of that because that, that's what made them mobile. That's what, that's what it enabled them to go like outside of Scandinavia and, and do all the raiding and trading and everything. And they well, wouldn't really have been able to do that without the sales, right? Yeah, and it's interesting to point out that that's actually a, a, a woman's contribution to, to such yeah. a otherwise male sort of domain. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see, Peter Clarkson says, to what extent has modern feminism influenced critical views of the sagas? Oh. <laughs> How much maybe, time do you have? <laughs> yeah, that may, be, that may be too big, but if you have a thought. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say that too. like like in any other, um, with any other sort of theme that, that like approaches have followed general trends um, in, the, in academia at, at sort of, wider. So I mean, in, in the 80s and the early 90s, everyone was doing like uh, second wave feminism, but also like anthropology and, and all kinds of, sort of new critical approaches. And then there was a kind of bit of a hiatus. And then I think now people are doing sort of interdisciplinary stuff and sort of more like sexuality um, and queer theory and um, including like trans approaches and so on. And so, um, yeah, I would just say that like there's, to, to boil it down, I would say approaches to the sagas just follow general 
academic trends? Sure. I mean, you would probably find a lot of the same theory if you were looking in journals from the same year of both Scandinavian studies and say, you know, it, whatever other language group and its and its literature. Yeah. I would think. Yeah, like middle English studies or something. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Phoenix says, uh, I saw someone ask if brewing and the actions associated with it, uh, okay, if brewing and all the actions with it were firmly associated with women uh, because they wondered if Odin fetching the cauldron for the mead was similar to Thor wearing a wedding dress. So is, is I guess, yeah, so I guess the question is, if, is brewing a woman's domain and then is Odin kind of intruding on it when he gets Otherir? Hmm. I've actually never thought about that. I mean, there's very, I mean, like with sort of most other women's work, like the, the only time it gets mentioned directly in the written sources, it's, um, it's you know, it, it, because it serves some kind of plot function or, or people happen to be at their work when then something dramatic happens. Um, I don't really remember any scenes where people are brewing, but there's obviously references to ale and that kind of thing. But in general, like food preparation was a woman's domain, but I've actually never um, come across a reading of that scene in the, the myths. But I mean, that would square, I guess, with like Odin's kind of um, gender bending in general. Hmm. So I would, uh, yeah, I would be, I would love to see see uh, someone elaborate on that. Uh, she also asked if, uh, what the social conception of marriage was like. So marrying for love seems more modern. Marriage used to be more about power or exchanging property in the past. Is that true of the Viking age or can we really tell? Absolutely. Yeah, it's to form because, <clears throat> I mean, you don't have a lot of social institutions. Um, I mean, you have the the like the parliaments, for example, the assemblies. Um, but other than that, I mean, you have to form alliances somehow with other people. Um, and so, marriage is one of the main ways of doing that. Um, yeah, I mean, you do see. I was just thinking. You know, you mentioned from Odebega Saga there was the. the the lady who has a fling, and you do see some of that. You do you do see people coming mm. together for love, right? But it's not, yeah. but it almost seems, certainly the sagas are all about drama, but it seems like that's almost a sign that they're not going to end up actually married, right? Yeah. I think about Uthrin <laughs> and Kjartan, or I think about Halfrether and what's her name, Kolfina and Halfrether the Saga, Vandera yeah. the Skulls, mm. uh, similar kind of deal where it's just, it's, it's those most passionate relationships that seem not to end up in marriage. Yeah. Uh, where the woman is instead married off by her father to someone that he thinks is actually a good match. Although you you see, um, uh, is, I think it's also in Lockstill Saga, is it when Olaf Peacock, uh, when his dad is trying to get him married? Oh, thought get it, yeah. yeah. To a Scottish yeah. uh, daughter. Right, and he's, so it says, well, I'll, I, I like the match, but I'll give you a veto which always seems to be something good dads do. And she says, well, I, I'm going to veto it because you told me you'd only marry me to a man who was, a, you know, a high status and this is a slave son. Yeah. I mean, and then they, they meet at the assembly and yeah. spend the day together. And then she, she changes her mind because he's so amazing. But, um, he's such a sharp I mean, dressed man. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take this like at face value. I would take this as like, you know, people are obviously discussing, you know, how should a marriage be, be um, sort of, how should matches be made? And like, maybe it's not a great idea if you don't let the young people ever meet and, and you kind of just force them into arranged marriages very violently. And that doesn't always turn out well either. And like, there has to be maybe like a middle ground so people get to kind of meet and, um, well, and I, yeah, I guess I mean, that's, sorry. that's part of what I'm saying with that scene is that the woman is in a sense enforcing the same norm, right? She's also yeah. making it about social status and such, uh, not about, you know, oh, I, I, I don't love him, dad. It's, 
dad, I don't think he's socially the right. Absolutely. Yeah, right. you're so absolutely it's, so, right. So everybody's kind of playing the same, they're playing the same game is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and there's not a sense, there's not a sense that, that there's like a desire to marry out of love that's being suppressed. Like everybody thinks of it in the same way. I guess is what yeah. I'm kind of trying to get at. And, and like, you know, the, for example, there's, I mean, the, the, the status issue, it just comes up again and again. And, um, you know, men, like fathers making their daughters marry men who the daughter thinks is beneath them isn't always going to go very well. Um, and there's, I think it's less about like mismatched personalities and more about the culture clash becomes a problem maybe. Um, Mm. and but but like you know there's also like in in whatever saga king's saga um oliver trickwason so i guess it's in his saga um so his sister um is called Astridir, and he wants her to marry some guy um who is like too too low in rank <laughs> you know in her opinion to be worth considering um, and she refuses to marry him. And then he sends her like a bird that's been, all the feathers have been plucked off the bird. And she sees this as, as a clear threat. And so she's like, okay. Um, and she yields. And then he kind of like, he makes the man like an earl or something. I can't remember what title he gives him, but it's a kind of concession. Hmm. Um, and it's very clear that like, you know, she doesn't really, have a choice and like the, the way that the saga author is kind of representing this as like, I mean, he, he's making the point that Olaver was not anyone who like, was gonna take any prisoners. And, right. um, you know, he, he, he drove a hard deal, but, um, but he kind of makes he did. Yes. <laughs> many, many, many anecdotes about him, but also mm -hmm. the, bit, I mean, the bit about plucking the bird, I mean, Given the other context that comes up in and in, uh, in the, at the end of Volsungs with Ranver mm -hmm. and and Jormenrecker, I mean that's it's a dark image in, yeah. in the sagas. Yeah, I mean, like imagine being on the receiving end of that gift. I mean, yeah, you, it's yeah. dark. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's been a couple of questions from a couple of the same people. I'm going to see if I can get a couple of questions from people that I don't think have asked one uh, since mm -hmm. we're getting close to an hour. That's all right. So. Yeah. Cameron Patterson says, uh, do you have any thoughts on the figure of Gudrider Thorbjarnadotir Vidfarla, who was mentioned in the Saga of Eric the Red and the Saga of the Greenlanders? Um, I do have thoughts about her and wrote about her in the book. Um, and I think um, she's, I mean, I don't know if this woman ever existed, but somebody like her must have existed. Um, we've found like archaeological evidence like in Newfoundland and Lanzo Meadows that suggests that women got like there's a spindle whirl that was found there. So right. women must have got as far as that. Um, I think she's like as a literary figure, I think she's really representative of like the Viking woman in many ways because um, she like she she's so resourceful and like I think maybe one of the things that hasn't really been noticed as much about her because you know there's all this stuff about her traveling so far and um having the baby like the first baby European baby that's born in, in the new world and all that but like she's I'm sorry, right it's not it <laughs> but like I think the thing I sort of noticed most about her when I really started to think about her more carefully was that um, she's so good at, um, she's got people skills, like she's really good at navigating tricky situations. I mean, um, like she also has this like mother-in-law that's a little bit difficult. And then like the mother-in-law doesn't want um, good good to live with with her. Like she, she kind of forces them to live somewhere else. and. Um, and then like, it doesn't like, there's not that much time that goes by until like, like the mother-in-law has not only accepted her, but just thinks she's great. And, um, and this situation, you know, in Greenland, when there is this famine and, and like the, the prophetess comes and, and Gudrid is a Christian and like, she's kind of 
torn between like wanting to be a good Christian, but also like it's clear that there there's something needed there to kind of break the situation. You know? Right, because she knows the the vat of the look or whatever those are. Those exactly. Songs, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So I just think that the way that she's represented is like, you know, clearly you didn't just need to be like brave and everything. I mean, she's just so good at navigating these these um sort of personalities and and situations um, that are you know complicated and and um, she always kind of comes out like really well. Um, well, and that ties in actually to something that uh, Peter here was asking about women accompanying men on Viking adventures. I mean, in those Vinland journeys, it's mm -hmm. like the third or fourth journey where women start coming along. Right, I, yeah. I can't remember exactly which one it is. I think it may be the fourth if you're mm -hmm. if you're following the timeline in Greenland Dinka Saga, that it's like the fourth where they start bringing women. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty early on. Um, yeah, I mean, they don't have any anything there really, like in terms of houses or anything until the women start coming along. Isn't isn't that sort of right? Well, they call it. I think they use the word "buðir" when Laver first goes and he spends the winter. He makes "buðir." Yeah, right. I don't know, yeah. like I don't, I don't know how much of a house to imagine that is, but probably not no. much of one. No. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just pretty clear. Like, I think both from archaeological sources and written sources that um, women were generally going along, and like, not just the kind of spindle world. Like, also in very northern Scandinavia, like they they found graves of women there in like traditional Viking dress and then also down the river, rivers in Eastern Europe. Hmm. Um, and so like, yeah, like there's brooches um, found all over the place and like in England and there's place names in England that suggest that like women were among the people who took land and so on. So um, not long after Norse settlement begins, women are going to be, are going to be coming with them. Yeah. Well, that's been right about an hour. Do you want to take yeah. any more questions or how do you feel on your time? Um, we can do like one or two more if there's anything that is. Okay, anybody who hasn't asked a question wants to throw something in? Uh, let me run back up here and look at a few of these from other people who have been asking lots of questions. <laughs> These are good questions too. Yeah. Um, S. Faust asks about uh, if you can talk about women's participation in religious practice other than Sather. Um, if Sather is religious practice, I don't know if I would call yeah. it that. I mean, this this is just there's just almost no no sources for this that are reliable. Um, I mean, the only thing I would say is make maybe the the depictions of some figures on these, like on the picture stones and the, the Oseberg tapestry. Um, like Which is the, a weird, weird image. I mean, yeah, you have to look yeah. at it to... And there are these kind of figures that are probably supposed to be female and they're sort of walking in the procession and they have various like paraphernalia. They have like, some of them have spears, I think, and some of them have these masks and whatever. And it's like, I mean, they, they must have played a role, but like we know very, very little about Viking rituals. I mean, beyond what like these saga authors are probably like making up for the most part. Right. Um, so I like I when I get asked about this, I kind of tend to just be very like <laughs> careful and boring and just say we don't really have any reliable sources. Or yeah, it's hard to really. Sources. It is hard to extrapolate from, you know, what we've got because so much of it is uh, it is so dramatic and fictional sounding. I mean, like I think about Lanoa book where you've got a couple Gidhir, right? Mm. Um, but we don't know what that really means or what they might have been doing no. or if that's fiction or nonfiction. Yeah, and it's it's so hard with that text, like the whole myth about like throwing off the, what are they called, the Andre Sulur, you know, the the poles that they they used to have like um, beside the high seat hmm. that um, like, and there's 
Sorry. Backing of our honest one. Yeah, and like throwing them off um, into the sea when you were kind of approaching land, and then you would like take land where where the the those things came uh, ashore, and like that's been shown to be like a, a, a just a, a literary motif that's been borrowed sure. from from classical literature, and like you know it's. It's it's hard to deal with these sources um, when it comes to religious um, themes. I would say. Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> well, if you'll take one more, uh, Peter. Yeah, the last one. Okay, Peter asked why there are no women outlaws. For instance, Halger there is a thief, which is a serious offense according to Grogos, but she's not outlawed. Were women protected from the law in that sense? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. Um, I, th I sort of wonder whether there weren't female outlaws and they just didn't get any sagas um, about them. Because like in later folklore, Icelandic folklore, there are female outlaws for sure. Hmm. And there are like at least Norwegian law codes that kind of talk about like thieving as being um, I, I, if I recall, like there's different um, like different punishments for men and women, and like women get their nose cut, cut off if they do it like a certain amount of time, or like fingers, and it's just really unpleasant. Um, but I just think that like maybe saga authors were just not terribly interested in um, telling that sort of story. Um, sure. I mean, there's like no saga apart from like Stella Saga really that has like a female protagonist at all. Um, and like even like Stella Saga, it's not really clear who is the protagonist. Um, so yeah, that would be my kind of. Well, this does give me the idea for uh, Baniar Saga or Clyde's. Exactly. <laughs> I'll see how far I can get into that during isolation. Well. Mm -hmm. Johanna Kaczyk, Friedrich Soder, thank you very much for taking the time with us this evening. Thank you for answering these great questions. And folks, go out and check out the new book, Valkyrie, the Women of the Viking World. Thank you so much for having me. I really available, enjoyed this. Available soon-ish, right? Uh, in two days. <laughs> two days, okay. Well, by the yeah. time people are seeing this publicly, it will be available. So run out and get it. And uh, thank you and have a great night over in Oslo. Thank you. I will. You too. All Take right. care, Bye everyone. All the best. Bye.